Now, today I'm talking to you about mitochondria or mitochondrial dysfunction. And why am I talking to you about mitochondrial dysfunction and what the hell are they? So the mitochondria are basically this energy powerhouse. So these are these little organelles that live in your cells, all the cells in your body, and they are responsible for turning glucose and fat into energy. And we know that people with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance have a level of mitochondrial dysfunction. So when we look, when we take cells and we have a look, they have, um, it appears as though they have 40% less mitochondrial density. So they have less mitochondria and they are smaller mitochondria. So that people with diabetes and insulin resistance tend to be really inefficient at burning glucose and fat into energy. And we'll talk further about why this is um, a problem and how this happens. So this is not to scale. Um, all your cells have lots of little mitochondria floating around and I haven't drawn anything else that lives in the cell just because otherwise it's gonna to get too busy and hard to know what's going on. So what normally happens is you have glucose, which is turned into ATP, which is basically the energy currency of the body or the energy currency of the cells. So ATP is energy and this energy is then available for the cell to use to function properly. Um, and then the mitochondria can also So fatty acids are basically just um, the small molecules of fat and these are also able to be burned um, and converted into ATP for energy. Now, a byproduct of this reaction is the generation of what we call free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So I'm going to, I'll use them interchangeably, it's the same thing. So you get these reactive oxygen species as a byproduct. Now we all think and hear free radicals and they're very bad, no one wants free radicals. And yes, it's true in excess, but to burn glucose and fat, to produce energy, which is essential for life, you are going to produce a small amount of these reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And that is normal, you know, the cell normally has a way to sort of regulate these and to soak them up so they don't cause any damage and they don't cause any problems. But when we have, you know, too much of this glucose and too much fat and the mitochondria become strained and stressed, then we get a buildup of these free radicals. And what actually happens is these free radicals, because we don't want too many free radicals, they can actually um, cause or contribute to this mitochondrial dysfunction. So the mitochondria, in, a t in an attempt to try and reduce the amount of free radicals in the cell, because if your free radicals build up, they can cause damage to the mitochondria. And in some cases, if it's bad enough, the mitochondria will die. And if you get too much free radicals building up in the cells, the cells can also die because it's too much stress because these free radicals also send out or they stimulate inflammatory pathways so they can also contribute to inflammation and we know that too much inflammation is also harmful. The other thing that these reactive oxygen species or free radicals do is they send out stress signals and they can, um, they basically block insulin pathway. So this is an insulin receptor um, on the outside of the cell. So when these reactive oxygen species build up, they actually contribute to insulin resistance. So I'll do that IR, insulin resistance. Because basically they're saying, 
you know, it's a message from the mitochondria saying, we have too much glucose, too much fat, we've got too much of this um, fuel to deal with. And we're not coping very well. So please don't let any more glucose into the cells because it's going to be too much for us and it's going to potentially cause the mitochondria or the cell to actually die. So it's a protective mechanism. So it's actually doing this to try and protect itself. So um, when you get this mitochondrial dysfunction, it increases the amount of free radicals and the mitochondria become very inefficient. It tries to slow metabolism to try and reduce the amount of free radicals. And while it does adapt and it does slow metabolism, it's still not enough to completely reduce the amount of free radicals produced. There's still an excess of these free radicals and there's still um, this whole sequelae. Now, what gets interesting is normally insulin is actually a, has a positive effect on your mitochondria. So normally when you eat a meal and your insulin, you have a release of insulin to try and um, allow that glucose to get into the cell. So when you eat, you get a rise in your blood sugar, your body responds and releases some insulin. That insulin is necessary to allow the glucose to get into the cells and out of the blood. So when you get a rise in insulin, the insulin actually stimulates mitochondrial function because it's saying we've got some incoming energy, we've got incoming glucose, um, the mitochondria need to pick up their game, we need more mitochondria to be able to um, metabolize all this fuel and this energy. So normally insulin actually stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis, it stimulates mitochondrial function and the, the number and size and so forth. But if you have insulin resistance, then the, um, this message doesn't get across. So the insulin is wanting to say, we need to get more mitochondria and we need to, the mitochondria to be functioning properly, but it doesn't get that message. So the insulin resistance can also contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction. So they go both ways. So the mitochondrial dysfunction contributes to insulin resistance and then the insulin resistance contributes to mitochondrial dysfunction and you get this negative sort of cycle happening. Now, when you get insulin resistance, it means the glucose is not able to get into the cells to be used for energy. So then you start getting a buildup of glucose in your blood. And so that glucose needs to go somewhere. And once your glycogen stores are full, because that will be the first place that it's stored, then glucose will get sent to the liver. And it's actually converted into more fatty acids. And that is a way to try and reduce the amount of glucose that's in the blood. And so glucose gets converted into these fatty acids that then, um, are, well, it makes your um, triglycerides, which is a type of fat in your blood, go up. And then these fatty acids are shuttled around the body and they can start to get stored. They either get stored in your subcutaneous fat on your belly, or when that gets full, um, and it's at capacity, then it starts to spill over and gets um, stored in your organs, which will also contributes to insulin resistance and other problems. Now, the thing is, these fatty acids, these are also, they don't need insulin to get into the cells. So, you know, a safer place for fatty acids is where they're normally meant to be, in the subcutaneous fat. We really don't want them building up in the cells in your organs. But these fatty acids, if they've got nowhere to go, then we will see um, that these fats start building up in cells where they're not meant to be. So these fatty acids they don't need insulin to get into the cells. So they don't have these insulin receptors to get through. So these fatty acids can get into the cells without the need for insulin. And that is a problem because 
it further <laughs> leads to insulin resistance. So when fatty acids are metabolized, we get these other byproducts. Um, so when they're metabolized, you get ATP, but you also get these other metabolites. I'm just going to call them MET for metabolites. So basically byproducts of this reaction. And these uh, metabolites, these also will contribute to insulin resistance. So the fatty acid metabolites will again say, don't let any more glucose in. So it's basically, we've got all this fat in the cells. We've got too much energy to deal with. The mitochondria um, can't handle it. And it's sending these signals saying, don't let any glucose into the cells because we, we have all these fatty acids here to try and deal with already. So you can see how this whole sort of cycle sets up. So the, inch, the mitochondrial dysfunction leads to insulin resistance. The insulin resistance makes it worse. And then you get glucose building up in the blood, which is turned into fat. Then the fats build up and accumulate even more in the cells and they make insulin resistance worse. So it's a continuous cycle that just gets worse and worse over time unless we do something about it. Now, when you get insulin resistance in the liver, so when the liver cells start to become insulin resistant, so they can too experience this mitochondrial dysfunction um, and insulin resistance. And normally insulin would switch the liver off and tell it not to release glucose. So the liver holds on to some glucose as glycogen. So it holds gl glycogen there um, for when your blood sugar levels might be low. So when your blood sugars are low, for example, overnight when you're sleeping and you're technically fasting, the liver will actually be releasing some sugar or glucose into your blood to prevent your blood sugars dropping too low. But when your insulin levels are high, so if you've just eaten a meal, your insulin level is going to be high. And so that insulin acts like a switch to turn the liver off and say, don't, leave, don't release any glucose because we've got glucose coming in from this meal and we really don't need you to release any. But if the liver is resistant to insulin's message, then it won't get that message. And even if your blood sugars are high, and there's lots of insulin running around, it will still release glucose into the blood. So then we start seeing high blood sugar levels because the liver is contributing to high blood sugar levels and this exacerbates the whole problem. And then when you get insulin resistance in your pancreas, normally, again, if you have eaten a meal and your blood sugars are a little bit elevated, your body's going to have, would have responded by releasing more insulin. And normally that would tell the pancreas that we've got extra glucose on board. We need to release more insulin to, to actually um, keep them down. But if you have insulin resistance in the pancreas and this mitochondrial dysfunction, it means that the cells, these beta cells in the pancreas are not secreting enough insulin. So they stop secreting enough insulin. And if there's not enough insulin, then your blood sugars go up. And again, it makes the whole problem worse and contributes to high blood sugars. And then you can get mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance in the fat cells. So normally when your insulin levels are high, when there's insulin around, it will tell the fat um, the fat cells to not break down the fat. So we'll say don't break down the fat because we've got enough energy floating around. We don't need to use our stores. But if there's insulin resistance, it doesn't get that message. So the fat cells will just start breaking down fat, spitting it out into the circulation. But of course, the, you don't need any of this fat. So there's all this extra energy and a lot of that fat then gets shuttled to your other organs and it starts to clog up your other organs. And of course, um, you don't want all this extra fat floating around in your blood either. But the other thing that happens is the fat cells will release these inflammatory molecules. So all of this and the mitochondrial dysfunction happening in all these cells, this is all contributing to inflammation as well. But the fat cells will release these um, inflammatory molecules that contributes to whole body inf uh, insulin resistance as well. 
and it releases this hormone called resistin. And resistin contributes to whole body um, insulin resistance. So it makes your cells more insulin resistant. And it also suppresses a hormone called adiponectin. And adiponectin is a anti-inflammatory hormone and it also would normally make you more insulin sensitive. So in all it makes you more insulin resistant and it promotes this inflammatory state which makes the whole whole thing worse. So you can see how this is sequali kind of develops. Now what exactly is causing this mitochondrial dysfunction in the first place? What is contributing? So really it comes down to having too much calories and too much of this fuel around and not enough demand for it. So if you're over consuming food and in particular, you know, these processed foods that are um, broken down very quickly, it's very easy to overeat um, these foods and they really, they flood your system with all this extra, all this um, fuel that it needs to do something with. And then if you're not exercising and you're not moving, if you're just sitting around all the time, then your demand is low. And so the mitochondria have this big flood and they really start to struggle, they start to stress and this is where we see these problems. Um, so oversupply and um, a low demand. There's also very strong evidence that fatty acids, a build up of fatty acids contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction. So kind of like we've talked about when you get a build up of fats, um, so these fats can come from your diet. So when you're over consuming fat, particularly saturated and trans saturated fats. So saturated fats come mainly from your animal products like your poultry, meat, um, fish, eggs, seafood, sort of thing, um, dairy. And the trans-saturated fats come predominantly from your processed oils, your vegetable oils, and they are predominantly found in your processed foods. So having a diet that's high in fat, particularly saturated and trans-saturated fat, these can um, contribute to this clogging up of the cells and um, contributing to this insulin resistance and setting up the whole sequelae. Um, but the fat doesn't just come from diet, it's also if, well, sorry, the other place it comes from your diet, if you're over consuming carbohydrates, because if you have extra glucose on board from the carbohydrates, they also are converted into fatty acids. So it's either dietary fats, dietary carbs, and I mean, if you overdo protein as well, that can also be turned into fatty acids. So over consuming any calories, um, but the processed and refined carbohydrates are the worst offenders because they are again digested very quickly and they make your blood sugars spike more quickly and um, they really put a stress on your body and your, your liver ends up converting them to fatty acids. Um, but then the fat is also just those fat reservoirs on your body already. So if you already have a build up of fat and um, you know, fat in your other organs and fat building up in all your cells, then this is also going to be putting a lot of strain on the mitochondria and the mitochondria um, start to shrivel away, some of them die, and then this makes the whole problem worse because you've got less mitochondria to deal with all this energy, this extra energy. And um, so, yes, this sets up the whole, whole problem. Um, the other thing that can contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction is um, environmental toxins. So environmental toxins, are, um, they can get into your cell, particularly, I mean, the ones that are even more concerning are these fat soluble ones because they hide out in your cells and they accumulate and it can take a long time to get rid of them. So it can take sometimes years, even decades to get rid of these um, chemicals. And they contribute to reactive oxygen species. So they, they promote this free radical generation 
and when there's uh, free radicals that are building up in the cells, that can cause more damage to the mitochondria and put more stress on the mitochondria. So what then can you do to try and improve your mitochondrial function, to try and take some of the stress off and try and um, get your mitochondria back up and running? So number one, and really it is number one, the rest of them aren't really in any particular order, but this probably is the most important thing to try and improve your mitochondrial dysfunction. And that is exercise. So exercise, I mean, your muscles contain the most amount of mitochondria because this is a place where there is more glucose oxidation or utilization. So this is a place that, um, where more of the glucose is used uh, to create energy. So it's like a glucose sink. So your mitochondria have the most amount, sorry, your muscle cells have the most and largest number of mitochondria. So when you exercise, you're not only building muscle and generating more muscle cells that then um, promote the, uh, or increase the number of mitochondria overall in your body, but the, the act of exercising and increasing your demand for energy stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. So it stimulates the growth of new mitochondria and it stimulates the growth of your mitochondria then. So they become more efficient and um, better able to cope. Now, initially, if you are, if you do have, um, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, initially when you start exercising, you're going to find that you don't have a lot of energy and it's a lot harder initially because basically you're very inefficient at burning um, fuel into energy. So when you're exercising, you have a greater demand for energy. So you need more of that energy and ATP. But because you've got mitochondrial dysfunction, they're not very good at turning it into energy. So you're not going to feel um, like you have as much energy to, to carry out the exercise at first. But please persist because the more you um, work out those muscles and the more you grow those muscles, the more you stimulate your mitochondria, the easier it will get and the better you'll get and the better your, mitochondria, um, better your mitochondrial function will get. So exercise is definitely number one. Um, then intermittent fasting is another good one, another good way at improving your mitochondrial function. So when you are not eating for an extended period of time, you, it means that you're backing off this fuel supply. So we're not inundating our cells and our mitochondria with this um, extra energy. And yes, it has uh, lots of stored energy in those cells that it still has to cope with, but it means that it's not getting absolutely flooded. And when, during the intermittent fast, um, when you're not eating for that period of time, it actually gives your body time to self-regulate and when uh, it sort of self-destructs, of course it depends on how long you're fasting for and how much of this happens, but the faulty cells, the faulty mitochondria, they all basically get um, killed off. So when they're faulty, we get rid of them. And then uh, when you start eating again after your fast, you start growing new functioning um, cells and you, your mitochondria and things like that. So intermittent fasting is a good way to improve your mitochondrial function. And of course, if you're going for these periods of time without eating and you're losing weight and you're getting rid of some of these extra fat, then that is also going to be beneficial. Uh, so, I mean, if I put fat loss, so it's sort of what we've already talked about, I mean, I personally think that intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding is sort of the best way to lose weight. Of course, healthy eating, uh, dieting, not always ideal. Not gonna get into that topic right now. Um, but generally, if you're losing fat, 
what is really important, so anytime you're trying to lose weight, if you're calorie restricting, it's so important that you maintain physical activity because when you lose weight, you're not always just losing fat. You, if you're not physically active, you're also going to be losing your lean muscle. Doesn't matter what diet you're on, this happens. So we don't wanna be losing any muscle because if you lose muscle, you're losing mitochondrial dysfunction, or you're losing mitochondria, and um, this is going to be detrimental. And your muscles, um, are, as I said before, a sink for glucose, and when you have more muscles, this improves your insulin sensitivity. So we want to maintain muscles as much as possible. So if you're losing weight, physical activity is super important. Um, particularly, you know, doing a bit of resistance training to build up those muscles and muscle strength as well. So fat loss, um, then Okay, improve your metabolic flexibility. So I encourage you to go and watch my video on metabolic flexibility so you understand what I'm talking about. But basically when you're metabolically inflexible, it's because you have too much glucose and fat to deal with and you're not very good at switching between the two fuel sources when you need. And when that happens, um, usually you have this backlog of both fuel sources and you become very inefficient at burning that energy. So go and watch my other video because I go into this in detail so you understand it. But improving your metabolic fl flexibility is going to help to improve your mitochondrial function. Um, then we've got... Avoid processed food. So avoiding processed food because we know a lot of these processed foods are chemically engineered so that you absorb all of the calories and you absorb them all very quickly. And this leads to a big flood of fuel coming in. And often they're engineered to make you want more and more. So you end up overeating them and uh, you know, it sets up a whole vicious cycle. So avoiding processed foods, but in particular, we want to be avoiding those processed and refined carbohydrates. So anything made of flour, anything with refined sugar, um, you know, basically your chips, your chocolate, your cake, your pastries, your ice cream, all of those processed foods, um, bread even, even if it's wholemeal, you just need to be careful um, because these are rapidly digested and um, can lead to a big influx of um, fuel for these mitochondria to deal with. So avoiding processed foods and again, particularly those processed oils, um, which are in processed foods uh, and minimizing saturated fat So minimizing your saturated fat, we've sort of talked about where saturated fat comes from. So that is to try and prevent the clogging up of your cells um, because when saturated fat is metabolized, it's going to increase these metabolites and saturated fat is more likely to get um, stored in your cells um, compared to unsaturated fats. Um, so minimizing your saturated fat intake Um, increasing your consumption of antioxidants. And I don't mean taking supplements. 
And I don't mean taking or eating bars and processed food that say that they have antioxidants in them because it's just, it's not the same. If you, to get your antioxidants, you need to get them from whole foods and you can get them predominantly or the most nutrient dense uh, foods that are going to be very high in antioxidants or your fresh whole foods, fresh whole plant-based foods as well. So your vegetables, um, your fruits, but don't go overboard on the fruits, um, all your legumes. So all your plant-based foods are going to be very high in antioxidants. And antioxidants have been shown to promote mitochondrial biogenesis, so promote the growth of new mitochondria and to promote the functioning of the, the existing mitochondria. And they also act to sequester these free radicals. So they help to soak up the free radicals um, to reduce the overall burden of free radicals. And of course, that's going to help as well with your insulin sensitivity. Uh, then, lucky last. Avoiding environmental toxins. This is impossible to completely avoid environmental toxins because unfortunately, in our, the state of our world, um, there are environmental toxins everywhere. I go into this in a lot more detail in my online program, but basically we want to try and minimize your exposure, exposure to environmental toxins. I mean, some simple ways to do that is to not eat out of plastic, particularly don't you know, heat plastic up in the microwave um, and to be eating whole foods because when you're eating packaged and processed foods, uh, a lot of these chemicals can get into your food. Plant-based foods predominantly because these environmental toxins can accumulate in fat of organisms, including animal products. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a whole big topic in itself, which maybe I'll do another video on, uh, but minimizing your exposure to environmental toxins is also um, important. Okay, so that is pretty much all I wanted to say today. It's a bit of a complicated topic. Um, hopefully it makes sense and hopefully you can see how mitochondrial dysfunction is very um, strongly associated and how it's linked to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and how it's um, really at the root cause and to treat your insulin resistance, we need to go back and look at what are some of these driving factors. And so people with insulin resistance and type two diabetes, we know that there is a level of insulin dysfunction and these mitochondria are essential for life. Your cells require these mitochondria to produce energy um, so that they can function and they don't want, they want energy when they need it. They don't want to build up a free radicals because this can cause damage to the cells, to the mitochondria. If it causes damage to DNA, that's when mutations can happen and that's when we can get cancer. So really we want to optimize mitochondrial function and here are a list of ways to do that. So I hope this has been helpful and I hope that you've got something out of it. If you have, please make sure you like the video below. If you think your friends or family might also find it interesting, then make sure you share it with them. If there's any comments or questions, feel free to write that in the comment sections below. If there's any other topics you'd like me to cover, feel free to also put that there. Um, so as I mentioned before, I do have an online program. So it's a 12 week online program and it's for people who are trying to find answers like this that they're not getting from conventional medicine, from their doctors, or they're having trouble finding what they want or what they need on online. So the program really looks really closely at what the root cause of diabetes is. So treating it properly so that we can um, treat the insulin resistance and
get everything back on track. So I'm looking to work, the program is really for people who are really serious, they're looking for answers, they are willing to invest time and money and to really commit to um, improving their health. So if that is you and you're interested, then make sure you um, book in a telephone consultation with myself or one of my um, team and then we can see if it's going to be suitable for you or not. So um, another big part of the program as well is mindset and motivation because uh, you know, we all struggle with it at times and it is a really big part of, or a big barrier to change um, and to improving health. So yes, if you're interested, make sure you book in a telephone consultation. But that is really all I have to say today. Thank you.